Good morning. Good morning. And maybe the first thing we can do is uh, maybe I can ask you your name. Betty Staling. And uh, you are involved with the college, and maybe you can tell me a little bit about how, at the moment, how you are involved with the college. Well, right at this point, I'm interim president, but I'm one of the founders. In 1976, a group of us founded the college, and I was teaching at the Sacramento Waldorf School during that time. And so that was 1976 to 1992. And in 1993, I came full time to the college. So I had been teaching part time until then. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I've been very involved over many decades. So, so how did you get to be a Waldorf teacher before college? I mean, how does yes. that work? Um, when I was a freshman at the City College of New York, uh, I had a wonderful history professor. And one day, well, he invited me up to his island, up in New Hampshire. And I was up there with my boyfriend, who became my husband. And um, very interesting, I asked his wife while we were washing dishes, what makes him so different from any other professor? She said, ask him about anthroposophy. And I said, what? <laughs> I couldn't pronounce it. Yeah, right, nobody can. <laughs> and um, I came from an atheistic Jewish home. And yet, when I was a child, when I was five years old, my brother died. He was killed in a car crash. He was 10. Not a crash, but a car accident. He fell mm. out of the car. Mm. And nobody explained to me as a child what happened to him, where was he. So I had terrible nightmares from the time I was five until I was a freshman in college. And I had horrible experiences of thinking of his body rotting in the grave. Yeah, horrible. Yeah. And I didn't tell anyone about it. So that night, we were up at the island, and I asked Dr. Easton, so, you know, what is anthro anthroposophy? <laughs> and he was a history professor. Mm -hmm. So he gave the whole story of the evolution of consciousness. Oh, wow. And afterwards, I remember thinking, oh, my gosh. Now, he's such a practical man. How could he be thinking about things like angels and what is all this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that night, when I went to sleep, I did not have the nightmare, and it never came again. So I'm, my soul was telling me one thing when my head was saying, this is crazy. Yeah. So yeah. that was the beginning. And so we became good friends. And, um, and at one point I learned about Waldorf education. And I was um, <clears throat> majoring in psychology and doing some extra courses in education. And I became interested in what he told me about the education. But more than that, I became interested, well, what is this anthroposophy? Yeah. So after about a year and a half of studying with him, where we were only working with one chapter the whole time uh -huh. in philosophy, um, because it was so yeah. mind-boggling. Yes, dense. Um, at that point. And then uh, he offered the opportunity for my husband and me to go to England. This is before Emerson. Even before, before Emerson. it was the Michael Hall teacher training course. Oh, yeah, okay. And two things, there were two reasons why I wanted to go. First, I wanted to figure out what was all this. And the second is, I wanted to go to Europe. Ever since I was in college, I wanted to go. And people would say to me, Betty, stop dreaming. Poor girls don't travel. <laughs> and over and over again, they say, stop this. You know, this is back in 1957, 58, 59. Wow. And kids didn't just take off, you know, I in know. the way that they do today. <laughs> so going to do our training in England, that's, that's pretty good. So he arranged a full scholarship for us because we had nothing. We, had, we got married. We got enough money at our, from our wedding for the... Um, the ship fare. Yeah. In yeah. those days it was the ship. Ship. I know. I came with the ship too. <laughs> and, and so we went and did the training for the year. It was very hard. It just turned everything I ever thought inside out. Exactly. Um, but it was life changing. And so after a year and a half, I became pregnant. We came back to America and my husband taught at the Kimberton Waldorf School. Uh -huh. And so for four years, I was a faculty wife. I had two children. I wrote plays. I I did all the kind of things spouses do for their teacher husbands, teacher husbands, yes, teacher wives. Yes, yes, yes. And, um, and then um, in 1965, I had written to the same professor, but I kept in touch with him, and asked him to be my son's grandfather, my godfather. Mm -hmm. And he said, he didn't answer me, he didn't answer me, and finally he did. He said, I'm so sorry, I haven't uh, answered you, but I've been up in Sacramento where I've told them to close the school, the Waldorf School, and because where in the world would you find five trained Waldorf teachers? Uh -huh. Now, three days earlier, a group of five of us who were at the school had met and decided we were leaving. <laughs> that was Saturday night. Monday came this letter. Wow. And that's how we got to California in Sacramento. I didn't even know where I was coming from. 
And New Yorkers think everything is in New York, you know? Yes, of course, everything is in New York. Well, <laughs> so when we arrived in Sacramento, in this, it was New Year's Eve weekend, um, there were, I now know they were big jackrabbits, but I thought they were kangaroos. And it wasn't snowing or anything. It was, no, it was it been raining a lot. There was no snow. <laughs> Lots of rain, and there were these lakes. These lakes are not on the map, no, because these are... They're called weirs. It's for flood control. Yeah, right. And I couldn't find this on the map because it only... Yeah, because they're drier the other exactly, times. Yeah. Exactly. So that's how we got to Sacramento. And so my husband, my first husband, uh, taught at the Waldorf School, and I was home for one year. And then I started teaching um, handwork, and then in kindergarten. Then I took a fifth grade, sixth, seventh, eighth, seventh, eighth, and then started the high school. So that was the beginning of that. And then that was 74, starting the high school. In 76, we founded the college. So that's how it all happened. I mean, I find that amazing, you know, how, how people find each other. It is amazing. And there's five teachers. You needed five teachers. Exactly. And I know. All trained. It, exactly. Amazing. And that we had sat the Saturday night before, and one was going to go to Norway, and one was going to go somewhere else. We weren't going to go together. Yeah. And yeah. then we did. So who were the other people? Um, Jean Atkinson and Richard Atkinson. Uh-huh. And Lexi Ahrens. Uh -huh. And then Franklin came, my ex-husband. Ah, yeah. We were the five. Yeah, we all came. And we all, uh, I was the only one not teaching at Kimberton because I was a spouse. But we came here and uh, that was the... Well, eventually you, te you taught oh, yeah. too. Refounding of the Sacramento Walter School, which had started and then opened, uh, grew too quickly mm -hmm. and then collapsed back Yeah, down. yeah, yeah. So yeah when was, it grows too quickly, it, yeah. a lot of times it's the yeah. parents, they really want it so badly and then, you know... Yeah. It, it makes a problem. So that's what happened. Yeah. So, so in in your professional life, then, uh, that how how did it come from your childhood? Did you have any indication that you would be a teacher, um, or even an administrator? I did. I did in the sense that really children do. Uh, I lived in an apartment house in the Bronx, and I used to gather the children around. You see, and we have school. Uh -huh. And so that was already there. But then, I think it was third grade, I wrote, actually wrote, I will never be a teacher, I will never be a housewife. And, uh, well, <laughs> when I found Waldorf Education, I knew that's what I wanted. Yeah, it yeah. combined my interest in psychology, mythology, art, um, every, literature, yeah. things I was deeply interested in at very deep levels. Yeah, yeah. And so then, when I was in the training, it still didn't click right away. And then uh, I had Cecil Harwood, A.C. Harwood, as a teacher. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. And he was teaching us about literature. Mm -hmm. And he started to tell the story of Gilgamesh. Now, remember that my brother had died. Yes. So when he taught this, tell, told the story of Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh loses his best friend, Enkidu, and, mm -hmm. and it's all about death. Yeah. And what it means, and that yeah. story went so deeply into me yeah. that that's when I knew this is what I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. And I remember when I was teaching fifth grade, and I had a girl in my class who's now 54, and she <laughs> did not want to grow up. She only wanted to play. Mm -hmm. And when I told this story, she painted the scene where Enkidu um, falls down onto the forest floor and sobs because the animals no longer know him. She painted it and painted it and painted it and painted it. And when she was done, she was ready to grow up a little bit. There you go. And I asked her, I know her now, and I said, Anne, do you remember that story? Mm -hmm. She never, doesn't remember doing it at all. No. no. Went right but into the unconscious. In but it is in oh, there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So now, where's the college now? How is it? Well, it's at a very, very critical time, very important time. Um, you know, many of the Waldorf training centers have closed, or they have reconfigured. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to sustain a full-time program. Even our one in Toronto was attacked by... I heard that. And that's uh, a very small one. Yeah, yeah. They have to jump through all kinds yes. of hoops in order to keep going. Well, it's, it's a very challenging time, and there are lots of regulations. The, the student population is very different. Yeah. Wonderful, by the way. Yeah. The young yeah. people are marvelous. Yes. Um, and so we made a decision. I stepped out of the college and went to half time about 10 years ago, uh -huh. figuring I just wanted to do some consulting and just have freedom. Do other things. Yes, mm -hmm. and I have been. It's been wonderful. Um, and we made the decision to go for accreditation, which is a very, very big decision. Yeah. And it has, but it, we felt not only was it good for us for survival, but more than that, it gave us an opportunity to be in the dialogue on education. 
because by that time we had been working with many public schools as well as independent schools. Yeah. And we saw what Waldorf education could do. Yeah. I, the I helped, results are there. Absolutely. And I negotiated the first public Waldorf program in Milwaukee. And so this was also sort of giving back to the fact that I came from a very poor family. That's when I became aware of you. Really? Yeah, Interesting. yeah, mm -hmm. Milwaukee. So, um, so we began the Public School Institute here at the college. Mm -hmm. And that's been going on for 21 years. And teachers come from public and parochial schools and so on. And they just, it, it re-enlivens their love of teaching. Yeah, yeah. So, and then we had the whole development of the charter movement and the fact that, you know, there are over 40 of those schools in California now. Yeah, and, and they're very popular. They're People very have popular. long waiting lists they are. They to have, get in. Yes, they do. They have lotteries. So, uh, we made the decision to do the accreditation. It's very costly. And Can you say roughly how much money is involved? Well, it's hard to say. You have to have certain kinds of databases. You have to hire a financial aid officer. You have to pay for the accreditation process. You have to have certain uh, positions. You're talking into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, yeah. It's a very big decision. And we were fortunate. Our fundraiser helped to fund a lot of that. And uh, But it doesn't... It's still a, a time until we will not be accredited till 2015. Yeah, yeah. So we're in this process of having to spend the money yeah. and not yet reaping the rewards. Exactly. So we have just hired a wonderful financial aid person for federal financial aid that will really help the students. Mm -hmm. So we've had to sprout while we're at the same time you know, trying to keep our roots strong. Yeah. yeah. And that's very hard. Yeah. So, um, so we're doing a lot of uh, self-searching and cutting things and adding this. And, you know, it's like you're trying to prepare the future but take care of the old habits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the college is 37 years old. It's our second moon node. Uh, it isn't, I find that so amazing. And you have to go back to the foundations and yes. clean things up. And we have so what happened around 17, 18? In the college? Yeah. So that would have been, let's see, 1776. <laughs> that if we went to 20, 1996. Well, Rene Carrito left in 1992, and he'd been the director for 14 years. Right. And he brought a wonderful cosmopolitan quality to the college. But the college actually began out of the work we did with Carl Stegman. Right. And his work on the spiritual America. Exactly. That's the founding of Rudolph Santa College. Exactly. And he was here for about two years. Mm -hmm. And then we invited Rene Carrito and his wife Merlin. And so it became a wonderful center. Um, but, you know, in those days you didn't have to do a lot of regulations. It was all very oh. casual. Exactly. It was casual. We had big classes. And, you know, we went through the 70s with the hippie movement and mm -hmm. all of that. And, um, and and then that all changed. And we have a very different uh, situation in, in the world today, the economy, the competition. There are many more training centers. Um, and there are many schools. And restrictions. And many restrictions. Yeah. And government regulations and so mm -hmm. on. We don't have the same regulations that Canada does uh -huh. because the, the accreditation process in the United States is not government. Uh -huh. It's through peers. Ah, yes. It's an organization mm -hmm. of peers. Mm -hmm. And it still has great requirements, very specific requirements. Exactly. And yeah, somebody said you have to have a library, for instance. You do. And you have to have a connection with research and all of that. Yeah. yeah. So all of this costs money. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going along my merry way, working part time and doing a lot of consulting and enjoying my grandchildren and writing. Yeah. I rewrote several of my books that were out of print and just, you know, that. Oh, yeah. And then in November, I got a call from the board asking if I would come back and, and, and be the 